<laughs> Carl, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Um, you have such a cool story. And when you messaged me, I was like, yeah, I need to have him on the podcast because I think that, you know, your story probably relates with a lot of people, um, especially probably in Utah. And I think that by you being brave enough to share your story with people, it, it will, I, I can almost guarantee that after this episode gets released, I'll get a ton of emails from people that are saying, oh my gosh, like I've experienced the same thing or, you know, similar. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about just, you know, today, like maybe a little bit about you and then let's just dive right in. Sure. Um, well, I'm uh, 53 now, year old guy, single. Um, so, you know, hey, no, <laughs> uh, have five children, one girl, four boys, and they're four of them are now in their 20s. And then I have a 18 year old son who is going to be graduating this year in high school. So quite a crew <laughs> that we're, I'm responsible for and lived in Pleasant Grove, Utah County since 2001. And uh, I mean, I'm just kind of going back. Grew up in Salt Lake County. I uh, got married when I was <clears throat> after the mission, 24, 25 years. I think it was right before my 25th birthday. Straight arrow. You know, I, you know, I, uh, high school, kept my nose clean. Uh, so did my ex. You know, you could have, well, we did everything by the book, right? Met her when I was a waiter at Olive Garden. It was kind of funny. And, uh, she was on another date. So anyway, it was a fun job. And then uh, we met, got engaged quick, got married real fast within six months. And then, you know, just started life out. We had uh, our first child after just a year, which was a little quick. And then, but back then in the early 90s, this whole new way of doing it here in Utah, I guess, with some of the younger folks now, uh, they wait a little longer to have their families, which actually, when I look back, that's probably smart. But, but you know, we were doing what, you know, we thought we were supposed to be doing. And so, um, you know, and she was a little younger than me. She was only 19. And I think that was a little hard on her, you know, and uh, having four, you know, five kids by the time we were married 11 years uh, was very difficult on her. And so, and at that time too, I mean, we, you know, we were going to church regularly. But around 2004 or five, I started getting kind of curious. And I had run across some stuff on the internet about the book of Abraham. And, you know, that read down, that went down a rabbit hole, of course. And being the YouTube channels weren't there yet, really. Um, so it was kind of the Wild West still. Um, John DeLynn had just started a podcast or something about trying to keep the communication open between people who were staying and leaving. And I hadn't got to that stage yet, but I read another book called In Sacred Loneliness. And then that led to Rough Stone Rolling. And then I really dug in and it kind of opened my eyes. Now, my dad, he went to, he had gone to BYU and was a history major. So, I mean, he knew his stuff, but, um, you know, he had a struggle too at one point. And I, I think that had a little bit of an effect on me when I was a kid. I mean, I went on the mission and um, I did have a, a counselor in my bishopric at the time when I was a youth tell me that I had a rebellious spirit, which I went to church every Sunday. So I don't know where he came up with that. And the same guy ended up excommunicated later. Um, <laughs> so I don't know where he came up with that. I think it was because of my dad's reputation in the ward. So I had kind of, you know, a brush with um, don't believe everything you hear, make sure you study and, um, you know, praying with subjective. I mean, I feel good. Well, you feel good about a lot of things, you know? And so I didn't hear any voices on high burning in the bosom other than some really spiritual experiences on my mission, which I'll talk about later, which kind of helped me down the road. But for the most part, I was, to be honest, bored. You know, we had five kids. Life was a routine. I was in the mortgage business at the time. I mean, I probably was doing some things that were not conducive to gospel principles. So there were there were a number of little things that just kept piling up. Well, when I started reading that, uh, there were some other things that were going on 
uh, and had been going on for quite a while, just, you know, for little instances, like we would get Cinemax and uh, Showtime and, you know, we had made this agreement that, you know, if anybody looked at any kind of porn, that it was together, right? Mm -hmm. That would make it better, of course. And so that began to escalate a little bit. And so then with me reading that material, it wasn't difficult in the terms of the spiritual frame of mind I was in at the time to say, you know what? I don't know if I buy it completely. And maybe it'd be nice to take a break. And so I was a little scared, though, because I had some friends at work who, you know, their wives had left. Now, this, you know, left them just because they had a porn issue. And I was like, wow, you know, that's a little extreme. Um, my ex was from a pretty tight LDS family that, you know, was well connected. And so I, you know, I figured I might be in a little trouble, which is kind of weird. I should have known her a little better than that. But uh, at that point, she agreed with me and basically she was done, which kind of surprised me. She hadn't read anything and I gave her some material to read. And, uh, and at that point, uh, we were kind of out, you know, we, uh, we both take, uh, stop wearing garments. We were a little nervous that our family would pick up on it, but then we kind of thought, what do we do now? It's kind of like Sunday's free. That was nice. But what do you feel the rest of the time in, you know, what, what do you do at that point? And, you know, there were some things that we wanted to try, you know, we hadn't, uh, I mean, we'd been straight laced, do everything by the book LDS kids when we grew up. And so at that point we, we started to experiment. Uh, we went to some clubs, we, uh, you know, started drinking occasionally on social reason, you know, for social reasons. Um, Uh, I gradually noticed that our lives became more and more about, you know, my wife and I's social life than really about the kids completely. What Um, did your kids think about you guys not going to church anymore? Like, how old were they at the time? My oldest daughter at the time, she didn't have as much trouble with it because the neighborhood we were in was a little bit higher end and some of the girls had treated her poorly in this. And we had moved within that year. And so she wasn't too happy about it. The boys, um, they were doing a little bit better with their, the young men, their age. Um, they were in scouts and one of them had just been baptized, but they were young enough. They were all under the age of, uh, um, I think 10 or 11 at the time that, uh, they really didn't you know, have too much trouble with it. Um, We we tried to fill Sundays as family day and we would, you know, go on adventures. And for a little bit, we went to an an evangelical church up in Draper that I found out later kind of uh, is kind of set up to attract uh, former LDS or soon to be out of the church LDS people. And um, I mean, the first day I smelled coffee at a church service it kind of shocked me and the other cool thing was uh you could wear shorts and t-shirts and um that was another thing and I was like well um first few times I was a little bit of culture shock for me but after a while I I kind of liked it but one thing I I couldn't understand and never could get uh comfortable with was the whole trinity um that was you know I tried a number of times to talk to the the head preacher Nice guy, nice guy. And uh, he tried, but uh, I just wasn't down with it. And uh, so after a while, we stopped going. And and there was a couple other reasons for that. Um, Going to these clubs, we had met some other folks that uh, were former LDS or current LDS. And uh, I was a little surprised on the current LDS, but they have their own stories. And I'm not going to get into too much of it. You know, over time, we started going to some of these parties that you probably shouldn't go to. I mean, I don't have to spell it out, but there's popular gym down in Draper. A lot of things are going on uh, in Salt Lake County that uh, would shock some people, especially people who are uh, LDS. But like you said at the beginning of of, of the cast, uh, you know, some of these people need to know that they're not, not alone. Right. Um, yeah. And so we made some decisions because... Honestly, we were, we were out. We didn't believe it. I mean, I was 
kind of done. Obviously, it wouldn't have been my first pick, but we ran into these people by chance, and um, they invited us to a couple parties, and it took us a long time before we even thought about participating. But uh, we eventually, you know, started participating. And then a crazy six-year period started. It went from just being casually involved to heavily involved to meeting another couple, uh, turn into more of a poly type thing. And then, I mean, it just <laughs> laid devastation to the marriage and, um, and it affected my kids quite a bit, actually. Um, Did they know kind of what was going on? Not at first. I mean, we were pretty careful. You know, my oldest daughter did. I mean, she was old enough that she figured it out. And one of the, my boys did too. And we were a little careless towards the end. The youngest ones never really knew too much about it. I had other members of my family start snooping. I mean, we went to Hawaii with this couple. And um, so anyway, you know, uh, you can never really hide something like that for very long. Um, you know, and because families in Utah are so interrelated, I mean, in each other's business, eventually we were found out and uh, confronted. And first it was my folks and uh, <laughs> my dad tried to do a fishing expedition. And have you ever heard of this term? And I was like uh, deadpan. Nope. But then I finally came clean. And uh, what was their reaction when you when you told them? Oh, my mom was furious just furious. Um, she was not happy with her. I'm her uh, oldest boy. And I'm still, she still looks at me as the baby boy, you know, years mm -hmm. ago. And I, I don't think I've ever seen my mom this, that, that disappointed. Then my dad, I mean, he was just trying to figure out what's going on. What's wrong with, you know, why am I, why am I involved in something like that? And soon her parents found out um, a, a almost a year or two later though, um, and, you know, they, they actually threatened to turn the kid, you know, us into child uh, services, but uh, it was kind of a, I mean, child services wouldn't have done anything because we took good care of them. Um, you know, things, things started to go way off the tracks. Um, and it, it, when you're involved in something like that, it gets to the point, it's all about you and, or you and your partner and whoever you're, partying with. Um, and it's, it becomes less and less about your family, about the, the purpose, why you're here. And, and if you have kids, you know, you should be taking care of them, spending time with them. Weekends should be with them. I mean, we, we weren't filling the week, that gap after we left the church with something that would be fulfilling. And one day, I mean, I kind of got into on the on the religious side too, I, I kind of got into this whole on Facebook, on general conference weekend, make sure I put in some uh, snippy comment or uh, meme or, you know, reference an anti article. I had communicated with John DeLynn several times. And um, so, you know, I thought I was kind of in the in crowd, you know, I went to new Mormon, new order Mormon. And, you know, there was a bunch of other websites at the time that, I was a member of. And uh, so I was thinking I was this real smart guy and had figured it all out. Like a lot of, you know, guys who leave, a lot of members who leave. Um, and then one day I was arguing with my dad on the phone about, you know, the church and he just, he just kind of stopped me in my tracks and he said, well, Carl, if you're so, I mean, if you're so done and you don't think there's any value here, why are you so emotionally wrapped into it? Why is it so important to convince me, which you're never going to convince me, that it's not true? And he's read everything. Nibley, uh, tinkering. Uh, I think Nibley actually wrote a whole book about uh, the anti side of things. And uh, um, I'll probably mispronounce the title, so I'm not going to go there. But I haven't read it, but he has. <laughs> so I was arguing against a wall, basically. I wasn't going to convince him. But he basically said, so if it has so much control of you, then why are you so emotionally wrapped into it? And I, I guess that, that immediately shut me up. And then at that point, I started really thinking about it. After that, weird things started. I um, noticed that on Facebook and social media, when my anti-friends would start ganging up on 
you know, people that I care about and, and people that I love. And I did notice that I became a little feisty myself and defending them and their uh, ability to believe what they wanted to believe. Over time, I almost, it almost became like a dogma that John DeLand, Kate, Kelly, and a lot of these people cling to. Uh, they've created their own dogma or in a sense, their own church. And I was a member of it. <laughs> and I realized that I'm like, that's not what I did this for. You know, I did this because I don't believe it. At that point, things really started going bad with this whole lifestyle that we were involved in. You know, it, it affected our, my marriage quite a bit. Um, now, I mean, you're naive if you ever think that that lifestyle is going to be good for your marriage. It's not. Also, too, um, I had a pretty good experience at a park with my sons. We went out to play football. It was a nice spring morning. I can still remember the day. Very vivid. It's one of those pivotal days that, you know, like 9-11. Uh, this was my 9-11. I was playing football with my boys. Uh, my oldest one, who was interested in this girl in another neighborhood, and she was very LDS, and he said, Dad, I, I really want to go back to church. I was like, Oh man, really? You know, and he says, yeah. And I said, well, why, why do you want to go back to church? Is it just because of this, this girl? And he says, no, he says, I just kind of miss it. And I said, well, why do you miss it? And he said, yeah, I just miss the feeling I had there. And he was old enough to remember. And then my other boys had been constantly badgered by the scouts in this neighborhood we were living in. And they had been going for quite a while, actually, the, the younger ones. And uh, they they chim chimed in too. Dad, we want to go back to Scouts. I mean, we want to go to church too because that's where our friends are. The neighbors in back, they were awesome. They still live in back of us. They had befriended my boys, um, especially when we were too busy with, you know, the things we were doing to really spend some quality time with them. And I mean, it was a tear moment where we all kind of hugged and um, had that moment and they just said, dad, can you take us back to church? That really just kind of floored me. And so at that point, and then I kind of knew things were going downhill. I knew my ex wasn't going to be happy because she hadn't made a decision to change, you know, and wanted anything different. What and was your marriage like at that time? Like when all of this happened, were you guys still, I mean, what, what did that look like in terms of your marriage? Sleeping in different rooms. Um, not communicating. I think she had already wanted to leave. Jealousy. You know, I, I think there were some other pent up things. I mean, we're good friends now. We talk a lot now, but um, I was also angry too, because I felt like she wasn't trying. I mean, that might have been a little unfair because I kind of helped steer us to where we were, you know, mm -hmm. and so I had to take some of that responsibility. And so I, I just knew that it was crashing at fast. And I knew it was just a matter of time before she left. I was more worried about the damage it cost at that point. I finally woke up. <laughs> That's why I say it was my 9-11. I was like, wow, I can't believe how bad this just, I just realized how bad it got. At that point, um, like I said, I knew that they were going to tell their mom. And so I was, wasn't too worried about it because it's like, well, tough, you know, Are they, if they want to go back, then we need to support them in that. And so that yeah, I took him the next week and Bishop immediately identified me as who is that, you know, they've lived in the area for five years. <laughs> they knew who I was. Uh, they're really good at that. Yeah, they've been loving us for years at that point, you know, leaving pies at Christmas and, you know, 12 days, you know, before mm -hmm. Christmas, uh, he cornered me after the meeting, wanted to meet with me, you know, immediately told me I need to come back to church every week. I was like, I don't like it when people push me. So you're probably not going to see me for another year. And I didn't go back for another year, but I would take him to church. I would drop him off and then go back and pick him up and uh, do that every week um, that they wanted to go. And meanwhile, Things kept getting worse. At that point, my spiritual journey started. When, you, when your wife leaves you, and now the boys wanted to uh, stay with me. My daughter had already moved out. She had graduated and, and was at the age that she just wanted to get out of there. I mean, right when you're going through a divorce, that year, before, you know, when it's extended like that, and you haven't separated, but because of finances, 
it's it's kind of ugly. It's hard on everybody. Um, I was working Uber and work. I was gone all the time and because I didn't want to be there. She didn't want to be there. And then when we were there together, it was it was kind of caustic, um, even though most of the time we kept it, you know, as, as nice as we could. But every once in a while there, some would break out, you know, and it would get pretty it get quickly ugly and then end real fast. But uh, the kids knew that, you know, something wasn't right. You know, I knew it was just a matter of time. And, and soon enough after that last Christmas, she, you know, she moved out. And uh, I was kind of relieved because um, immediately the, the spirit in the home changed. Um, the boys wanted to stay with me um, just because they wanted to stay in the home and see their friends and go to church. And, and my ex was good enough to support that. She moved in somewhere pretty close. And then they would get to see her, you know, on visitation, that kind of thing. But for a while, that's that's how we had it. And during that time, um, I had to do a lot of self-reflection. You know, I'm I'm in a pretty bad spot. And and what was really cool at that time, though, and I had inadvertently ran into a friend at uh, I was in the mortgage business at the time, and they had invited me to he's a network marketing company that used to have their leaders in Amway and you know, not something I would push or normally be involved in um, before all of this, you know, some really good people that would go to these meetings. And I went to one of these meetings and I mean, I don't know, I can't even remember exactly what the message was, but the, the, it was a temporal message, but also kind of, you know, how people in the LDS faith, we, if we go to a meeting, even a business meeting, you're going to wrap in some gospel message in it. And so, for the first time in a long time, I kind of felt the spirit, you know, and, and I also realized I, I was so off track. I needed something like this. And so I signed up and I started going to those meetings. But it was uh, about six months into that. There was a real bad night. My ex took all the money out of her bank account. And I saw I thought, OK, it's happening now, you know, and it wasn't. But and my car had a blowout on the freeway up to this meeting that I was going to go to. You know, I had this medical issue. And then my friend, he picked me up and he gave me a blessing. And it just kind of, we had a long talk. And and basically, he just said, you know, Carl, he said, I get the feeling that you want to come back, but you're kind of stubborn. And I'm like, yeah, there's, there's these issues. And, you know, these issues that... I haven't put on the shelf yet that I think are big issues that um, the church has problems with. And he, and he kind of said, okay, okay, let's, let's put that to the side though. He said, you can't have one foot in and one foot out. In other words, you got to get both in. And that kind of hit, you know, I finally stopped wanting to get smacked in the head. And I realized that if I'm going to do this, I need to do it the right way. So went back to church and this bishop, he was still there and he saw me and he pulled me aside and I said, you better get the Kleenex box. Uh, we're going to be a while. And so uh, for the next hour and a half, I kind of poured out everything. Uh, what happened, where I was at, we both cried, gave me a big hug. I felt a little better, you know, and uh, he said, will you please come to church? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And so the thing that really, though, sealed the deal, um, and it was was probably the thing that before I had left, I'd probably have been the most nervous about, but was, uh, you're going to need to talk to the state president, of course. And I said, oh, okay. And I was like, all right, well, I'm ready. You know, if you need to excommunicate me, you know, lay the boom down. I mean, I deserve it. I want to get this out of the way. I want to start the process of healing. Remember I went in, see our stake president, and uh, I don't know if everybody thinks their stake president's going to be a general authority someday, but I kind of feel like this guy will be. But nice guy. In fact, it's kind of funny. He's a CEO, CHO of a human resources, some big company somewhere. But, uh, you know, I had never met him. I didn't know who he was. And uh, first thing he does is he comes in and gives me a hug. You know, it's funny how all these leaders give you hugs. You know, <laughs> you're not a huggy person. He just said, um, come on in. Let's, let's say a prayer. He wanted me to give the prayer. 
which I felt a little uncomfortable. It was a really short prayer. Or maybe, no, he gave the prayer the first time. I'm sorry. He wanted me to read a scripture. I hadn't looked at the Book of Mormon in years. So I flipped it to someone, a scripture I remembered from my mission. And so we read it. And then he opened it to Alma. <laughs> we stayed at Alma 29 through 32 the entire time I met with him for the next six months. I mean, that was it. That's all we talked about. But anyway, we started reading the scriptures. And then pivotal moment was he looked at me and he said, Carl, your Savior loves you. And when he said that, um, sorry, I just remember the, the feelings, but um, that was it. That was, I mean, I felt the spirit more than I've ever felt it. You know, it was, it was incredible. And uh, I walked out of that office. Um, I was higher than a kite. I mean, I hadn't felt as light um, for years. I, I didn't realize how heavy my spirit had been until that moment. So for the next six months, you know, I met with him and then he wanted to have me meet with the high council. And so, I mean, I was okay, you know, <laughs> I'm out. Um, I found out a lot more about how church discipline works too during that process. And a lot of it's up to him. And I had done everything they had asked. I think, you know, based on our meetings too, he'd realized that um, I really wanted to change and I was done, completely done with everything. Probably the next biggest woman was the uh, high council and people who are afraid of the high council, you shouldn't be. It is really a council of love. Um, they say that and I always kind of laughed and when I was in my anti days, you know, made fun of it, but it really is. Those men were very loving and very interested in my story, but more importantly, they were interested in what I've been doing currently and how I felt where my testimony was. And I remember bearing my testimony in front of those men and completely at peace in terms of what would happen after, you know, and I was, you know, I sat for quite a while waiting for him to decide. And then when I came in, they all gave me a hug and I was put on probation for uh, a year, but it turned into two, but uh, just because people got busy. But uh, eventually my parents had their 50th anniversary and they wanted me to get to the temple. So I kind of said, I, I kind of move this along if we can. And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. You're good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, then you have the, you have to go again before them. And then they are not probation anymore at that point and um, asked to, you know, your, all your blessings are restored. And so, I mean, the one thing I do remember, we, we continue to meet a, a few more times, the stake president and I, and uh, one thing he told me, he was just, uh, he said, just be aware that a lot of the struggles you probably may have had before this all started, before you fell away, that you're still going to have to deal with them. It's pretty heady, all the spiritual uplifting you get through the experience, but when it's over, he's right. I mean, COVID hit just shortly after that. Uh, everybody stopped going to church. <laughs> uh, you know, you watched it on TV. To be honest, I wasn't ready to do the gospel lessons with my kids every week, you know, and I, I'm sure they knew that. So, you know, people still to this day, you know, I go out with a guy that's now the first uh, counselor in the new stake presidency in my uh, stake. And we go to uh, Neaters every, you know, every couple months and uh, just talk. He, he and I, it was funny. He was the the bishop, uh, he was just on the tail end when we moved into this house and I was in the middle of doing my thing with my ex and he and I were stake missionary companions back when I was first married back in South Jordan. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And he had actually showed me the neighborhood he had moved, bought a house in, which was right by where my house was that we just barely moved into. And so uh, I got a phone call from my ex saying, hey, uh, the bishop's at the house and I know who that guy was. And it's like, I think I know who that is. She said, yeah, he lived in my grandma's ward. And I'm like, oh boy. And so I walk in, he looks at me, I look at him. I knew what he was thinking. <laughs> and I, felt, I immediately felt a little guilt, even though I kind of was proud and 
you know, very anti at the moment. You know, I could wait for him to get out the door, but he and I are best friends now. And he stood by me the whole time. I think members do their best. They all, they try their best. And I think when you're, when you're trying to get out of something like the church, you're finding any excuse. And they're such easy targets. You know, my, my minister doesn't do their job right. Or someone said something to me. Um, uh, this leader said something at a BYU t- uh, devotional. I mean, with Holland and his comments about uh, the LBGQ issue. I'm sorry, your path out was it started long before that. I think we've got to check ourselves sometimes in our attitudes, um, and especially with our fellow members. Um, these people have the same kind of busy life that you and I have. I mean, we should, we need to stop judging them. They're doing their best. And I'm so thankful for the people in this neighbor neighborhood, this war, you know, and there were some good people in the, the previous one. You know, we had both used the excuses and reasons for leaving and then kind of unloaded it on them as one of the other reasons we're leaving. Uh, when in reality, it was all on us. That's the reason we were leaving. All I can say is, um, you know, be wise in terms of the way you treat people, because they might be the people that actually are the ones that, you know, hold out their hands and help you back. I'm very grateful for them. And I found out other people who would put my name in the temple, my mom, every week, you know, uh, they, they're temple workers up in Boise. Other members of my family had been praying for me. Um, I have a great relationship with my ex's uh, father still, you know, they are extremely happy that I'd come back and the kids were baptized and uh, I did set apart my sons in the priesthood. So there's been a lot of blessings. Um, I've, I was able to go with my son to the temple when he, before he went on his mission before COVID hit. And I have another son who wants to take his endowments out soon. I have another son who's getting ready. Well, he'll leave on a mission not right when he graduates, but he's he's trying to earn money. He wants to pay for most of it himself. Oh, I do have a great story too. I've got to I've got to tell this one. This is my sure. this is my third son, David. I, I'll, he he probably won't mind. Uh, he's the one that just got back from Reno on his mission. Uh, served two years there, and he's trying to figure things out now. Single. He's in singles ward here in Utah County, and uh, so girls, he's he's available. When he was just graduated from high school, it was, no, we had just split up, but he, he was kind of this mindset, you know, he hadn't gone for quite a while and he, he didn't feel like he wanted anything to do with it. And, you know, he's kind of close to his mom. And so, you know, he, I don't think he wanted to disappoint her, but was part of it as well. But um, I might be reading into that a little bit, but the few times that I had tried to invite him to come to church, he'd been kind of real standoffish and basically pushed me off and didn't want to want to do it. So we have this thing called Zion's Camp in our state. And it was, you know, during the summer, um, you know, the church has been a little more creative on the scouting program. So I went to this meeting for my younger sons uh, and and basically asked if you have anybody else that would like to go, why don't you ask him? And this brother Harris, my friend who, you know, in state presidency, he, he came to me, he's just like, ask David. And I said, He's, he doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the church. And he's like, ask David. And I was just sitting there. And I started feeling this feeling. Better ask David. So I went home. I told him about it. I, I'm a sales guy. So I pitched it. <laughs> I said, hey, this is going to be fun. You're going to go up in the woods. I mean, I know you're not an outside guy, but, you know, you're going to be in a cabin and there's going to be girls there. And you're going to, uh, you know, have all these cool experiences. And how religious is it going to be? I don't know. Probably a little, but you, you'll be OK. And he's like, OK, I'll do it. Shocked me. He tells the story better when he was there, but. Um, so he goes up to this camp and I didn't hear anything, you know, I wait for the kids to get back and they get back and he sits me down and I'm like, "Uh Oh, I'm going to hear about it. Right. You know, you know, all the things that are wrong with it. And he's got a big smile on his face and found out he was the superstar at this thing. Um, uh, he bore his testimony the last night. 
I mean, after that, he wanted to go on his mission. <laughs> he went and talked to the bishop, took care of some things, you know, uh, got a job at the post office here in Pleasant Grove and worked his tail off for the next year. He saved almost $15,000. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, crazy. Wow. And pay for his whole mission. Plus, oh my gosh. Know, had money to get spare when he got home and uh, still has it, you know. And so wow. just no one helped him. I mean, he paid for his entire mission. <laughs> so and then uh, it was funny, too. He was the first missionaries taught at home during the COVID. He was supposed to go to Mexico City. And they basically said, no, you're, you're staying in the MTC at, at the house. So it, I was one of the first parents that dealt with a kid at home during wow. you know, having the MTC. And then, you know, the whole ward, we had a lot of kids going out at that time. And so everybody kind of had to deal with that. But uh, I mean, just incredible the change in him. And I, you know, just recently, it was a night I was struggling and couldn't sleep and uh, just got home. You know, we just had a long talk about the gospel and, you know, some of the struggles I was having. I could, I felt like I could talk to him about them and didn't have to be his dad. You know, I could just treat him like someone I would, you know, a friend because uh, he is an adult now. And it was just, you know, when I went to sleep that night and I told him the next day, I said, you know, it's just amazing to have someone that had the spiritual experiences you had to have that priesthood now in my home with mine, of course, but it's just to have someone else that, you know, I can communicate with and, and talk about these kind of things with. Um, it's great, you know, and, and I remember in my prayers that night, thanking the Lord for, you know, the fact that I've been blessed so much um, based on where I was. And to be honest, that's probably what I struggle with sometimes. And I'm getting a lot better now. You know, my stake present called it vain regrets. And uh, I mean, yeah, the Lord might have forgiven you for your sins. The atonement is a real deal. You know, the effects of it still you have to deal with the, the, the sins that you commit. Um, and it also takes a while to forgive yourself and let it go. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing I realized, letting my anger go with my ex letting my anger go with myself, which was even the hardest, hardest part of all, you know, realizing that, uh, you know, I'm a child of God and he loves me, you know, just like the stake president said that day, which, you know, I felt, but I really didn't understand, I think until now. So it's taken that long to really learn that. So I just take it day by day now. You know, I saw your uh, YouTube. I'm a YouTube nut. In fact, I even got my own podcast with some friends right now. Oh, that's awesome. What is it? Free, free Dad Bots. So, oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. We're on Spotify. We just had our first episode and uh, we awesome. all grew up in West Valley and all in the same ward. And so, um, yeah, we're just, you know, three friends that are talking about the past and people we know and subjects about the 80s and 90s that you younger kids need to hear about. So I think, Ashley, you're kind of, you'd be in that category. Yep. I'm a 90s. <laughs> I'm a 90s kid. <laughs> anyway, but I think what you're doing is awesome. So keep it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is a labor of love for sure, but it's worth it. I I think that it's so cool to hear your story. And I mean, when you were just talking about forgiving yourself and I thought, what a cool thing for you to come on the podcast and share your story with thousands of people that are going to hear it. And I mean, yeah. shared my whole background story, which is very wild and crazy. And, but there's something really healing about using your challenges that you've been through when you know that it's going to be kind of the roadmap for somebody else getting through something similar. And mm -hmm. so I just, I mean, I don't think that it's any coincidence that, you know, you're on here sharing this story with these specific challenges because people need to hear it. And I just, I don't know. Like, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and reaching out. And I have a couple questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. So I've shared this before on other episodes, but we, Lauren and I both have noticed like a lot of people that you were talking about where their whole life is dedicated now to, you know, the church in a negative way, like their whole you know, people with their whole social media is dedicated to the church, attacking the church. Um, 
And people come to our social media pages and, you know, say things to us. And, um, and sometimes Lauren and I are kind of like, how do we respond? And I'm just curious to know, like, if you have any advice maybe for somebody that is just in that transition phase of like, maybe they were, you know, very loud and proud about their anti, anti Mormon, you know, uh, feelings and thoughts. And maybe they start to feel like, you know, maybe I am wrong here or whatever. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have? Like once your identity is so wrapped up in that, to change, it's got to be very humbling to come back. Well, it's 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 difficult. It depends on the situation. I I think um, if you feel like they're really sincere, if they're just being sarcastic and they're trying to get a rise out of you, um, it's better to ignore it. If they're sincere but they they really just want to be right, I do kind of reverse it. I I'll do the same thing my dad did, and because I look at it kind of like when you go through a divorce and, I, and hopefully you don't have to worry ever worry about that. But if you do, uh, or break, and even if you've broken up with someone, it takes a little while to heal. Um, and some of these I've, I've noticed some people who leave can just leave. They're gone and they never think about it again. And it's kind of odd, but most people aren't that way. Um, they have all these imagined hurts and, and emotions because a lot of it's based on how they grew up. You know, a lot of the hurt, uh, anger um, might be with their parents, situations that occurred when they were younger, things that, I mean, in our situation, there were some things that happened when we were younger and I'm not going to go into that. And they get like attached to the church because maybe grandpa had a position in the ward, he was a high councilman, and then he did these things, you know, in with the family, or you know, someone in the family did it. Why didn't he know? He should have known that. Um, you know, those type of things happen in LDS families, unfortunately. Um, and I think we sometimes, and I'm not a therapist or psychologist, but I think that we attach meaning to that, and then uh, it becomes kind of like a crudgel later when we want to, you know make our voice known and especially with other ones we feel like are being diluted or um, really don't understand the truth where we simply just want to rain on their parade you know especially those happy mormons you know oh my goodness they drive you crazy right and so what a better way than to take them down give them some facts that they can't refute but I, i've seen these two parties interact and i mean it's You've got one side that I'm going to convince you that the Lord loves you and you're going to come back. You're not going to convince them of that. And then the other side, same thing. You know, I'm going to convince you you're deluded and Joseph Smith's a fraud. You're not going to do that. It's not going to happen. I I don't know where the catharsis is because I never saw it. Um, I never felt like satisfied making fun of LDS people. And when I find someone that I feel like is truly like, questioning but if i have some good rapport with them i'll just say hey look is this really about what you've read or is this really about what you want to do we went off the track that's when the justification started that's when um you know i, I and, and then i had a bishop come to me and he said i think you're not living your covenants I'm like yeah how do you know and uh and uh, of course we are uh, I, I've read these books and, oh, which books did you read? You know, and then we got this long conversation and you can confound your Mormon or LDS friend. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to do that, but that's where it comes down to faith. You know, I mean, they keep saying that and people just don't seem to get that message. This is what our, our faith is about. Faith is not a, a perfect knowledge. I mean, there has to be some trust that, what we're doing is eventually, I mean, eventually we're going to see our Father in Heaven again and, and believing in the message that Joseph Smith taught. I mean, there's some faith in that. I mean, would I love to be able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that the Book of Mormon is an actual ancient record that uh, horses, you know, existed in that time period? Sure, I'd love to. But, I mean, I may not. And, you know, what's crazy 
is even on the other side, the, 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 the dogma, the church of science they've created, they're always having bits and pieces of their dogma shaken or knocked out of, knocked out. Um, and it happens all the time as time goes on. So anyway, I, I just kind of move past that. And I, I just try to, you know, if you dig in, if you jump in the mire with them, that's, that's all it's going to become is it's going to be a mess. And uh, so the ones that um, I know are sarcastic and just have an ax to grind, I ignore it. Just tell them, you know, if they keep pushing, I'm like, Hey, I love you, man. Uh, let's talk about sports. You know, the Utes are horrible. We'll go Cougs. <laughs> You know, that really makes them happy. And then that's I'm not going to tell my husband that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that that ends the conversation. We move on. Um, and then with those that I really, you know, I think are sincere. That's why I'm saying, actually, I, I will just uh, I mean, can you really just leave it alone? Can you just walk away from it? And if they tell me no, then I say, then there's something still there. And you got to figure out what it is. I and love that. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. And. You know, that's up to them. I mean, yep. I figured it out. They can too. I think the Lord expects you to figure it out. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not an easy, it's not as easy path. I, I mean, do I, am I grateful for the lessons I learned and the blessings I have? Yes. Do I wish I would have done it a little easier? Sure. You know, but. I can relate to that for sure. <laughs> anyway, I think we all can. <laughs> yes, I think so too. I think that, you know, we go through these things because do you, would you say that you're coming out through all, all the things you went through, you know, would you say that it refined your testimony and, you know, the testimony you have is more mature than it was previously? I think maturity. Yes. I, I think that's a good word for it. I, it's not, it's not my primary or uh, pre priest quorum testimony or even my MTC testimony anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it's a testimony earned from years of um, hard knocks and loving experiences. And mm -hmm. uh, especially through this, as they say, never again, that's my motto too. I mean, that's why I brought up the nine 11. I mean, it's, it's so apropos in my situation. It's uh, I never want to go through that again. Maybe that's why I'm a real, kind of reluctant to get too involved in dating right now. You know, eventually I got to get over that too. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I just don't want to have to go through anything even remotely like that again. So anyway, yeah, so, yeah. For sure. Well, this has been such a good episode and I just, I'm so grateful that you reached out to me because your story is amazing and I yeah. can't wait to, to publish it and have everyone hear it because it's awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks, Ashley. And, and you keep doing the good work. It was fun being on your podcast and I'll be a fan too. I'll keep watching. So awesome. All okay. right. Thank you have a good so night. Much.